Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, Tony Blair, standing in for my good friends, George Galloway and Gayatri, over the next few weeks, before I begin my next stint as the Middle East Peace Envoy. April Fool, well, I'm pleased to say that Tony Blair will not be presenting Sputnik. Hopefully, he'll be on a one-way journey to The Hague soon. My name is Neil Clark, and I will be orbiting the world with Sputnik over the next few weeks. Well, it finally happened. This week, a full 279 days after the British people voted by 52% to 48% to leave the European Union in a national referendum, Prime Minister Theresa May sent off Article 50, the EU get-out clause, to Brussels. She described it as a historical moment from which there can be no turning back. Nigel Farage celebrated Brexit Day in typical style, with a pint in the pub. But is it really game over for the Remain camp? With powerful forces still opposed to it, could Brexit yet be derailed, either in Parliament or with fresh legal challenges? And what would the political repercussions be if the government can't, for whatever reason, deliver the clean Brexit that millions of Britons voted for? Joining me now to discuss these very hot issues is the publisher and editor of the Politics First magazine, Dr. Marcus Papadopoulos. Marcus, welcome on board the Sputnik. It's a pleasure to be on here. Thanks very much. So what happens next? We've got Article 50 finally sent off, and now we've got two years of negotiations, haven't we? This is a pivotal time for Britain. The UK economy is now in uncharted waters, mm -hmm. and no one really knows what's going to happen to Britain in a post-Brexit world. Uh, we have to give credit to Theresa May. She stuck to her timetable. She did mm. say late last year she would invoke Article 50 at the end of March, and she has done that. But uh, as I said, we hear experts on both sides, the Brexit side and the Remain side, saying different things. We hear from the Remain side that it's going to be a disaster, there will be an imminent recession, and we hear from the Brexit side that there is this golden future in store for Britain. I suspect the answer will be somewhere in the middle. Well, the pound has gone up this week, hasn't it, after Article 50 was finally sent. I mean, how much can we read into that, Marcus? I don't think we should read too much into that. Uh, the, there's lots of fluctuations regarding the pound, and we saw mm. that in the immediate aftermath of Brexit last year. We've seen the pound go up and go down. The real crucial period will be in the next two years. Let's see how the pound fares, uh, how, the, how the pound fares over the next couple of years because then that will be an indication during that period of time to see if foreign uh, investors in this country will actually remain or if they will go. David Cameron and George Osborne last year attempted to bully and bludgeon uh, the British people into voting to remain by saying that uh, in the immediate aftermath of Brexit there mm. would be a recession, a terrible recession. Now, of course, that was a gross uh, exaggeration. But at the same time, when we hear... Uh, from the Brexit camp about a golden future in store, we have to seriously question that. What does a golden future actually mean? Because at the moment, Britain is plagued with problems. We have energy prices, which are constantly going up. We have train fares, which are constantly going up. Four million children in Britain live in poverty, mm. one of the highest levels in Europe. So what does a golden future mean? I think what it comes down to is we have heard people from the Brexit camp and the Remain camp make grand statements, but unsubstantiated statements. And the politics of all of this, how is it going to pan out in Westminster? Uh, we know the Labour line, the Labour this week, Keir Starmer said there's going to be these six tests that the Labour Party is going to hold the government to, and they would only vote for the Brexit deal if, if it goes along with those six points. Uh, Labour is, is quite split on this, isn't it? Well, in this. theory, this is a great opportunity for the opposition, a great opportunity for Labour and Jeremy Corbyn. However, the Labour Party, or more specifically the Parliamentary Labour Party, is beset by problems. There is, an, there is a civil war going on in mm. Westminster, 
at the moment. And we saw that hours after Brexit last year, when there was a real opportunity for Labour to say to the country, uh, this is who we are, this is what we believe in, this is how we want to implement it, please listen to us. But instead, there was an attempt to overthrow Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. So they blew it last year. And uh, nearly one year on, we're coming up to nearly the first anniversary of the referendum, and Labour hasn't really changed. Jeremy Corbyn has uh, tremendous problems to have to deal with, and I think he is trying to appease the parliamentary Labour Party, mm. which of course is the, uh, is the threat to his leadership. The, uh, the threat to his leadership does not come from the grassroots, it comes from the parliamentary Labour Party. So he is trying to tame them, he's trying to keep uh, or trying to create some sort of new unity at Westminster. Mm but it's not working. However, on the other hand, we do need to be, uh, we need to be fair. Uh, what people say um, in opposition doesn't necessarily mean they will stick to that when they become, for example, the leader of the opposition or when they become prime minister. We saw that with William Hague prior to the 2010 general election. He was one of the most vehemently anti-EU Tory MPs. <laughs> yes. He becomes foreign secretary almost overnight. He becomes pro-EU, mm. so much so that conservative backbenchers start referring to him in a derogatory way as the foreigner. Yes, absolutely. And what about the United Kingdom, where, you know, there's a real threat now, isn't there, of a break of the UK if, if Brexit does go ahead, with Scotland to talk mm. about a second referendum there. Mm. Uh, how's that going to pan out? And of course, Northern Ireland mm -hmm. as well, where we've got uh, Sinn Féin coming out mm. very strongly in favour of EU membership. Well, the irony, of course, is that uh, British foreign policy, for decades now, has created turmoil around the world and has resulted in numerous countries breaking up, for example, Yugoslavia. Yep. So it could be now that Britain actually faces the distinct possibility of breaking up or collapsing, however you want to word it. And of course, the first one in the Union could very well be Scotland, because Scottish people are starting to realise <coughs> that in the immediate aftermath of Britain withdrawing from the EU, something like 80,000 jobs in Scotland would be lost. And that's just in the immediate aftermath. What will happen six months after or a year after? I think in regard to Northern Ireland, um, that's not the same because we have about a million Protestants in Northern Ireland who, of course, are overwhelmingly Unionists and the Catholics are still in the minority. So I don't think there's any real chance of the North vo uh, voting to reunify uh, with the Republic of Ireland, with the South. However, the day could come when the Catholics, or will come when the Catholics are the majority, mm. and that is when Northern Ireland could vote to reunify with their brothers in Dublin. Uh, bearing in mind what's at risk and the fact the UK could, uh, could fall apart because of this, and bearing in mind the very powerful interests against, still against Brexit, we're talking about people like Sir Richard Branson, who's forming this group as need to fight Brexit, mm. our friend Tony Blair, who is campaigning against it, Peter Mandelson, a lot of establishment people don't want this to go ahead. Could it still be derailed? I think history has shown, Neil, that anything is possible and anything is possible in politics. Who would have thought that uh, Brexit would happen? Who would have thought that Donald Trump mm. would become president? So I think it would be uh, only a fool would say at this moment in time that uh, Brexit will be implemented. Mm. I think we have to be very, very cautious because there are some very powerful figures who are opposed well, to yeah, it. Industrialists and Industrial, financiers, in, the City of London, a, absolutely. multinational companies. And multinational yeah. companies. And I think we have to be fair that mm. uh, Britain's membership of the EU is not a black and white issue. I personally do not like the European Union for ideological reasons mm. and foreign policy reasons. Ideological because it, it supports privatisation, which I think is uh, deadly to a country, mm. in particular poorer countries, and foreign policy because of what the European Union did in regard to Yugoslavia, Libya... And Ukraine, of course. Uh, Ukraine, yeah. and, uh, and now Syria. But on the other hand, I do believe the wealthy countries in the EU actually do benefit. So when people say that uh, this is, a, this is a, a revolution in process, I think that really should be kept to Hollywood. But if Brexit were to be blocked, Marcus, by whatever means, legal or, or by Parliament, then surely there'd be a, the, the public, the public reaction to this would be so furious, a revolution. It would appear, going by consecutive opinion polls, which have been held since last uh, summer, that uh, a significant percentage of people who voted for Brexit now regret it. So we can't say with certainty that most people in England are actually in favour of Britain leaving the European Union. But if somehow Brexit was derailed, will there be protests on the streets, uh, in central London, outside Parliament? Undoubtedly. But there is no history 
in Britain to show that the British people are a revolutionary minded people, that they have what it takes to stick it out. Um, so I don't believe there will be a revolution. And if Brexit doesn't happen, I think there will be a lot of protests, but they will simply this die could be away. The issue. This might be the issue. This could just be the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, because not just about Brexit, but about the fact that people will feel cheated. Whether you're for or against, you know, we had the referendum, 52% voted to leave. And if by some means that wasn't, uh, didn't happen, mm. uh, then people, quite rightly, are going to feel cheated in the democratic process that they've been lied to or, 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 or let down. I think the, the British people, they spoke last summer, um, though they spoke by a very, very slim mm. uh, majority. So if Brexit doesn't happen, undoubtedly a lot of the people who voted for Brexit will feel cheated. But we have to also take into consideration the British mindset, and I don't want to generalise, but the British people are known to moan about a lot of things. But they the don't, weather, we've they, got to moan about the moan weather, about Marcus, the weather that's, that's fair but enough. we don't act <laughs> upon anything. We moan about the increase on the 1st of January every year of train fares, though we don't do anything about it. We moan about the energy prices going up consistently, mm. but we don't do anything about it. I mean, they are real serious issues which are causing millions of households in Britain serious problems, yeah. but no real action is taken by the British people. But we could renationalise them now we're out of the EU, or when we are out of the EU, it would be easy, wouldn't it? This is the left-wing case, the Lexit case. Yes, but that, that is not going to happen that, under that a we could renational. No, no, but, but the, the hope would be that if there were to be a, a different government coming in, they would be more easy for them to renationalise the railways, get our rail fares down. Mm. And I think that was the main argument for Lexit, really, wasn't it? That economically, yes. the government would be able to change our economic system. But that all depends on a Labour government coming to power, mm. and it doesn't seem uh, possible at this moment in time yeah. that Jeremy yes. Corbyn yes. will win the next general election. So that means there's a distinct possibility the Conservatives will be in power indefinitely. And if Scotland gets its independence, mm. then it will be very difficult to see how Labour could ever form a government uh, at Westminster again, because it means Labour would have to win seats in the South. Well, only Tony Blair did that by making... Uh, the Labour Party, essentially another Conservative well, it, Party. It would certainly be, be very hard for them, wouldn't it? But isn't there the biggest danger of all, perhaps, if we have a kind of fudged Brexit, the uh, sort of British compromise that doesn't please anybody? Yes, that could cause a lot of confusion in mm. Britain, and I think a lot of foreign investors uh, would feel somewhat perplexed in that mm. sort of scenario. I think an investor wants to know one way or the other way. It's either good news or it's bad news. If it's bad news, they can work on it. If it's good news, mm. they can extend on that. But in the middle, with uncertainty, that's how uh, Britain could lose a lot of its foreign investment. So it needs to be implemented. It's either implemented or it's not, not in the middle. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Marcus. It's been a great discussion. Thank We've you. got two more years of this to go, so I'm sure you'll be on here again on the Sputnik explaining what's going on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Don't go away, because coming up next, after the break, we'll be discussing Yemen. <laughs> Welcome back to Sputnik with me, Neil Clark, standing in for George and Gatry. Don't mention the war. That line from the classic 1970s sitcom Faulty Towers sums up much of the mainstream coverage of the appalling terror attack in Westminster recently. There have been plenty of column inches from pundits on what we need to do next, but it seems that questioning British foreign policy, in particular in relation to the series of regime change wars against secular governments in the Middle East, and how this has directly led to the rise of ISIS remains a taboo. As does the backing the West has given to radical jihadists in Syria and the close and cosy relationship we have with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Instead, the pro-war establishment, always eager to point the finger of blame at someone else, look for new scapegoats, the very latest being the encrypted messenger service WhatsApp, which has earned the wrath of Home Secretary Amber Rudd. The same Amber Rudd, incidentally, who sat for many years on the political council of the pro-war neoconservative Henry Jackson Society. To discuss the contradictions which lie at the heart of British foreign policy in the so-called war on terror, I'm joined now by Catherine Shakdam, the director at the Shafkafna Institute for Middle Eastern Studies and the author of The Tale of Grand Resistance, Yemen, the Wahhabi and the House of Saud. Catherine, welcome on board Sputnik. I thank you very much for having me. Uh, the, the hypocrisy really is off the scale, isn't it, from the British government and the political establishment. Let's think back that less than four years ago, the same British government wanted us to bomb Syria, to bomb the Syrian government, which was fighting against ISIS and al-Nusra Front and other 
terrorist groups. And uh, now this same government is, is alarming us about the threat of radical Islamic extremism. And yet they were on the side of these people. Uh, it, they, are, they are still on the side of these people mm -hmm. in Syria and elsewhere. Now, it's very interesting because it's a kind of a two-speed policy here where when we're talking about the Middle East and Syria, um, mm. as you mentioned, then, you know, suddenly we have to uh, fight, you know, terrorism. We have to address the issue of counterterrorism. We have to, you know, do something about regime change, which makes no sense whatsoever. Because well, it's, well, against secular governments too, exactly, which are fighting against these... Same Technically genius. speaking, President Bashar al-Assad has absolutely nothing to do with terrorism. I mean, he's mm. not the one who's promoting it. He's, not, he's the one who's fighting it uh, with the help of Iran, Russia and um, Hezbollah. So you would like to think that Britain would support a government who's actually actively... Well, we're doing the very opposite, aren't we? We're trying exactly. to get rid of the Syrian exactly. government. They've tried that for many years. Exactly. But then something very interesting happens is that when uh, a so-called moderate... Uh, cross over the border and comes to, to crash in London or in the UK or somewhere else in Europe, uh, then he becomes uh, a dangerous radical that we need to deal with and whatever crimes they commit is a crime against freedom everywhere, uh, which I find very interesting because it doesn't seem to bother the British government when it happens in the Middle East and they're okay funding them and calling them moderate, slapping, you know, different yeah. euphemism or labels to them. Uh, but when it comes crashing against their people and, and horrible crimes are being committed against their nationals, uh, then it become an Islamist problem. But aren't they the one funding the Islamist problem by actually aligning themselves with the likes of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, um, and other, I would say, um, you know, grand war criminals and, and grand radical maker or architects mm. of terror? We know this to be a fact. It's not, a, it's not you know, uh, a fairy tale anymore. Uh, they are proof. They are, you know, it has been documented. Um, you know, this is so why are we that... doing this? Why, why is the British government, on the one hand, condemning so-called Islamic extremism and radicalism at home, yet is supporting it in Syria? It has done for a number of years. Yes, uh, in Libya as well, of course, uh, when Muammar Gaddafi said that the West mm -hmm. were lining up with al-Qaeda, he was ridiculed, but we know that was the case. So why are we doing this? Why are we backing these people against these secular governments? What, what's the sort of end game? What, what, what's this all about? I think there's many answers to this. But the first thing I would say is access. Uh, and I'm talking about geopolitical access in that the Middle East um, is mm. very interesting geopolitically from a military standpoint, uh, where countries such as, you know, the US, Britain, um, the UK and others would like to have a, a strong footing in the Middle East to be able to project their own policy and continue to have some kind of a remnant of imperialism. Um, mm. if you want to call it that. And then, of course, there's the issue of natural resources and access to natural resources. When you look at Iraq, Syria, um, you know, and to an extent Bahrain and Yemen, uh, and Libya, of course, um, mm. and Egypt now, because Egypt is on the firing line, uh, you need to understand that, you know, there they, they are billions to be made in terms of, you know, access to natural resources. Not mm. just oil, but we're talking about gold and minerals and, and other things, Afghanistan as well. Um, so you, ha you have to compute this. And then, of course, there is now the, you know, this idea that we're starting to, to kind of wrap ourselves, uh, our mind around, where Saudi Arabia, yeah. you know, the West now, Western capital, are actually promoting Saudi Arabia's agenda in the Middle East, acting, I would say, a proxy for Saudi Arabia, not the other way around anymore, um, mm. helping them manifest a new reality in the Middle East by funding, propping, uh, aiding, abating, and, off and offering cover when it comes to the media, to the war crimes Saudi Arabia is committing in the Middle East. And Yemen, how does that fit in? The war in Yemen, how does that fit in with this general so-called war on terror and the relationship with Saudi Arabia? We don't hear too much about it, do we, uh, no, in the we British don't. media, comparing to what we saw about Aleppo and the claims of genocide going mm -hmm. on. And we had to intervene in Aleppo because yeah. the Syrians and the Russians. And yet in Yemen, we've got a humanitarian catastrophe going on, haven't we? Yes, we've written we a book do. About this. We do. Yeah. Yes, I did. I did. Um, the thing is, with Yemen, it's a very complicated beast because it actually exposes the Western hypocrisy in that, uh, you know, we cry often. I mean, some, some media have come, Channel 4 did documentary a few months back, crying over the famine in Yemen, which is a reality. Mm. Uh, and yes, we should cry. Uh, but who is, who is engineering that famine is the UN is manning a humanitarian blockade, which is legal, uh, but they're still doing it anyway. And then they're crying, calling for funds to be released to the Yemeni people, which is fair enough. But then why are you manning a humanitarian blockade in the first place? Because Saudi Arabia asked for it. And the problem in Yemen is mm. that Yemen was not supposed to be a long war, uh, but then it turned out to be a long, drawn-out war. Um, and then it exposes the Western agenda and, of course, Saudi Arabia war crimes and the, the latent uh, genocide that they're committing against the Yemeni people. Yemen is a blueprint for Wahhabism. Mm. Um, the Saudi Arabian government is trying to imprint itself on Yemen, on the Arabic Peninsula, trying to, again, manifest a new reality and essentially buy you know, Yemen to its Wahhabist agenda. And we ought to be very, very scared because if you consider 
that you know we've seen how you know uh, a Jordanian pilot was burned alive. How many people have been you know have seen their head chopped off? Mm. Women have been sold to sexual exploitation. What Saudi Arabia is doing in Yemen is even worse because they are genociding an entire people. You're talking mm. about 26 million people now um, that have been earmarked for death, and no one is saying anything. It's fascinating, isn't it, when you think of the liberal newspapers, but people like The Observer, etc., columnists like Nick Cohen, who are always calling for intervention against the West's official enemies over war crimes, etc., or genocides, and yet these people have been very silent on Yemen, haven't they? they, they their silence, I think, speaks volumes. They, they don't want an intervention there to save lives, it seems. Oh, no, they don't. And uh, quite the opposite. It, 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 it's quite astonishing, isn't it, that the humanitarian, the great humanitarians, uh, haven't got a thing to say about it. No, nothing. But the thing is, if they were to actually speak, speak you know, against the crimes which are committing in Yemen, uh, they would have to speak directly against Riyadh and its Wahhabist regime. Mm. And this is something that they're not prepared to do uh, for very obvious reason. I mean, money is flowing towards Western capitals. Um, the Saudi government is buying billions worth of weapons. Uh, and of course, you know, Britain and other capitals do not want to lose the cash cow, I would say. Mm. So of course, they're quiet. And, you know, who cares about Yemen? Yemen is a poor country that is standing up against Wahhabism. Um, we, they don't want to make too much noise about this because then you would actually sit them on the wrong side of history quite, you know, openly. They don't want to do this. They don't want to admit mm. to guilt. And you can't have this argument that, uh, you know, Prince Salman went to Washington, um, I think it was about two weeks ago, accusing Iran of promoting terror. But really, we know that Wahhabism is not a product coming out of Iran because, of course, that would be counterproductive to, mm. to Iran, which is, you know, represents Shia Islam. Exactly. I mean, it's 90 yeah. percent Shia. Why would they create a monster that takes you know, the annihilation, it would be ridiculous. Uh, and of course, we know that, you know, funding come from Saudi Arabia, that they are being trained by Saudi Arabia um, on, and, and being armed with Western men weapons. Um, so I think it's all just about creating this cover and trying to just weave uh, a ridiculous narrative around people's ears to try mm. to put them to sleep. It's not working anymore. So what could be done about this? I mean, you know, we, we know what's going on. You, you, you said that Saudi Arabia is playing a key role in this. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some people who would argue that Saudi Arabia is actually a proxy for the West. The other argument, you've argued that actually it's the Saudis pressurizing the West, if you like, to go along with this. Yes. We're selling them weaponry and making a lot of money from it. Well, I think uh, that the Saudi lobby has gained a, a lot of influence mm. and the West has kind of eroded its own power and is basically acting, like I said, a proxy to, to Saudi sort of Arabia. There's a coincidence of interest here between Saudi Arabia, the US, mm -hmm. Britain, Israel. Yes. In targeting Shia countries and Shia uh, and secular governments in the Middle East and backing Sunni radicalism and Wahhabism. Well, to, so everybody, if you like, in that alliance, mm. that rehad, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Washington, London sort of alliance, mm. well, have got an they, interest in this. Yes, no, they do. But what they're really trying to do, because I think we need to be careful, when you talk about Wahhabism, it has nothing to do with Sunni Islam. Uh, sure. This is the story they're yeah. trying to tell you, trying to, to uh, create this sector and divide yeah. between Sunni and exactly. Shia Islam, which doesn't exist, by the way. It's, uh, it's again, it's a fairy tale. Mm. So, but it's, it's very interesting for them to just divide and conquer, because then, you know, uh, it's... It, well, it's it, been the age of the imperial been, strategy, yes, isn't exactly, it? And when the British exactly. set up Saudi Arabia in the first place, exactly. that was part of the, and while, the plan. To yes. stop Arab unity and coming together. Exactly. So while Sunni and Shia are arguing over ridiculous, uh, you know, theology called, you know, mm. uh, well, who benefits? You know, technicalities, the technicalities, the um, then the Wahhabi are taking over and imprinting mm. themselves onto politics and religion, religion uh, and whatnot. And it's dangerous. Mm. Uh, but of course, you know, if you want a solution, it's very simple. You need to, to realign uh, foreign policies and actually choose your friends a bit more carefully, not, uh, you know, not... not mm call Saudi Arabia, which is a grand war criminal regime, a friend of Britain or a friend but of Washington. If the Saudi lobby is so strong, we all know about our relationship with the US, is mm -hmm. it likely to happen? There's going to be a bit of a, a sea shift, isn't there, for Britain to change its foreign policy. Perhaps Jeremy Corbyn could offer some hope of that, or in the Labour Party there might be a I shift there, which could. is why he's coming under such attack, possibly. Mm -hmm. I think he has he criticised Saudi Arabia, hasn't he? Yes, he did. But I think, I mean, will come a time where, you know, Britain and others uh, will need to decide um, you know, what to do in terms of their future. And national security is at risk when you think about it. When you think about what happened, um, you know, uh, at Parliament. Yep. This kind of attack are really a harbinger or, or maybe yep. I would say a warning of what is to come if we allow for Wahhabism to further kind of embed itself well, of course, it's, uh, it's all within about society. WhatsApp, isn't it? It's all about YouTube. The Home Secretary would rather course, us focus course. on the internet uh, providers well, it's, it's technology. and, it's and always technology, technology isn't and it? not and focus too yes. much on the relationship with Saudi Arabia or oil. Uh, issues or, or United States following well, the United typical, States. Isn't it? Yes, it's, classic it's, Let's tactics. find a culprit away from the real issues and try to to get public attention directed over there while you know something is going on over here. It's always the same technique that they're using. But I, I'm I'm thinking that people now are actually quite awake 
mm. uh, and are realizing that, I mean, it is all a lie. When you look at Syria, I mm. think Syria really kind of like tore a hole in the narrative. Uh, it has lasted for so long that people can see the truth coming out to the surface now. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. And I think Yemen well, will play a role as well in, in really shifting this idea that Iran is a problem or that, you know, um, mm. that there is, there is no real um, Islamic problem. It's a Wahhabist mm. problem. When we wake up to that and realize that Wahhabism doesn't speak for religion anywhere mm. uh, and is actually just a political construct of fascist system, then maybe we'll get somewhere. Well, let's hope so. Catherine, I hope so, certainly. Great. Thanks so much for coming on the Sputnik. My pleasure. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. I've been Neil Clark, standing in for George Galloway and Gatry. And as George would say, it's been marvellous. <laughs>